Uh, we'll come to order. Uh, I'd, I'd, start, uh, I'd like to start off and uh, thank our witnesses uh, for uh, joining us to help assess our readiness uh, to protect Americans from biological threats to national security, including the Department of Homeland Security's ability to detect, to mitigate, and deter uh, these threats. We will also discuss how this committee can work to ensure that the Department of Homeland Security's Countering Weapons of Mass Destruction, or CWMD, office and uh, other government programs tasked with tackling biological threats have the resources uh, as well as the tools necessary to fulfill their mission. Biological threats can emerge from any number of disease-causing agents such as bacteria, viruses, or toxins, whether naturally occurring accidental or deliberate in origin, these agents can be used to harm humans, plants, and animals. We have seen how naturally occurring biological threats, such as the virus that causes COVID-19, can significantly harm our communities if we're not adequately prepared for them. We also face threats from biological weapons that have been manufactured and have been weaponized for the purpose of deliberately targeting Americans. For example, we have seen bad actors deliberately use anthrax, ricine, and other harmful biological agents in attempted attacks, including targeting elected officials. These bioweapons have the potential to cause everything from mass casualties to incapacitation to agricultural destruction and other serious disruptions to our economic and national security. Compared to other weapons of mass destruction, bioweapons are cheaper to develop. They can be deployed covertly and often have a delayed onset, making them an appealing choice for bad actors to utilize against randomized or targeted acts. In response to these threats, DHS has taken actions to bolster our nation's biodefenses, including the BioWatch program and its replacement, the Biological Detection for the 21st Century Program, or BD-21. These programs, by all accounts, uh, have not measurably improved our nation's ability to identify possible biological threats. They have, however, uh, improved the coordination between the federal government and local partners on addressing such threats. In their 2021 report to Congress, the Government Accountability Office found that DHS's biosurveillance programs, including the BD-21 program, lack sufficient technology and other resources to carry out and to define their mission. I also remain concerned about the BioWatch program, which has suffered a number of setbacks, including high rates of false positive tests, significant delays in identifying possible threats, and an inability to detect familiar threats. The committee is also responsible for considering the reauthorization of the Department of Homeland Security's CWMD office before the end of 2023. This office has previously faced uh, unsteady leadership, low morale, and the inability to retain qualified employees. Although these are signs that these, uh, there are some signs that these uh, issues are improving, uh, this body must consider whether structural changes at DHS are needed to ensure that they can successfully combat biological and other threats. In addition to bolstering the federal government's readiness to tackle these threats, we must also support innovative efforts by other public and private entities. These programs uh, are, are evident in my home state of Michigan, uh, which is home to vaccine manufacturers uh, and experts developing decontamination techniques, as well as the University of Michigan Flint's uh, forthcoming biosecurity program which I had the opportunity to discuss uh, with their chancellor earlier this week. Michigan has uh, also conducted exercises that test the responsiveness of state, local, and federal partners to biological attacks and uses test results to identify how we can improve our ability to combat these threats. Today's hearing will allow the committee to examine how the federal government can build on these kinds of efforts. I look forward to hearing from our panel of healthcare and national security experts and how lawmakers can advance an effective and comprehensive strategy to protect all of our communities from all biological threats. I now turn to uh, Ranking Member Portman. Uh, you are recognized for your opening comments. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate your, your comments this morning, and I uh, thank the witnesses for being here. Interestingly, a lot of the experts who are before us today are those who have been sounding the alarm as to our current uh, biosecurity, and so I look forward to hearing from you. And I thank you for uh, being uh, willing to stand up and, and speak out on this. Uh, I think the pandemic has taught us uh, once again that we've got to examine the effectiveness of our biosecurity posture. It's about all kinds of biosecurity threats. One is man-made, of course. Uh, others are accidental or naturally occurring pathogens. Um, and as we've seen over the past couple of years, this can have a devastating impact on our country or, or even the entire globe as, as we've experienced with COVID-19. Over the past 20 years, uh, we have seen attempts at biological terrorism, notably the anthrax attacks in 2001. You remember following that, subsequent to the attacks, there was, there was a lot of activity, including setting up much of what we're going to talk about today. Of course, the uh, harmful pathogens, uh, including H1N1, Ebola, and most recently COVID. Despite these threats, our nation's biosecurity efforts have been too fragmented, in my view, among several different agencies and departments, which makes it tough to have accountability, hampers coordination, and makes us less able to be prepared for a large-scale biological hazard. Hope we'll talk about that some today and more about what we can do to ensure we have the best biodetection capability out there um, and make smart investments in research and development in this area. I am concerned about our, our uh, capability in terms of uh, the ability to detect uh, various pathogens that, that uh, could do us a lot of harm and are not uh, currently detectable. The Department of Homeland Security's Countering Weapons of Mass Destruction Office was just talked about, CWMD. We'll talk about that a lot today. Um, very significant role in this mission uh, of biosecurity. Uh, but the office is plagued with some challenges, some of which are perennial, uh, some of which predate the formation of the office itself. And as I said, some of it is, uh, is lack of coordination. BioWatch is the primary biosecurity program at DHS operated by the CWMD office. Uh, for the last 20 years, in my view, BioWatch has consistently underdelivered on its intended purpose to detect biological agents that could possibly pose a hazard to the public. So in my view, um, the roles need to be clarified, but also detection expanded. And again, I look forward to the views of the experts today about whether that's their opinion. And if so, what can we do about it? We've invested as taxpayers over $1 billion into the BioWatch program. And the CWMD office now wants to upgrade that program, as uh, Chairman Peters just said, with this BD21 program, Biodetection of the 21st Century. I think it's a good time for us to ensure that that uh, BD21 program is based on a strong foundation and, and uh, ensure that it's the kind of investment that uh, is going to be worthwhile for taxpayers and, most importantly, that it's a system that can, that can protect the American people from these harmful biological threats. The authorities of this office, CWMD, at Department of Homeland Security are set to expire uh, late next year. Uh, this gives us an opportunity here in this committee to reauthorize and uh, with the reauthorization to make the necessary changes so it, uh, it does have uh, a broader capability and is better organized. So it, it may require more funding, um, but I think mostly it requires better organization and better accountability. And that's what I hope we can talk about today. We'll have an opportunity, again, with this reauthorization to uh, take a careful look at this and improve the system. So I look forward to hearing the witnesses' assessments of where we are now with regard to our preparedness and their recommendations for improving this national effort to safeguard the American people from these biological threats. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Ranking Member Portman. It's the, uh, the practice of the Homeland Security and Governmental Affairs Committee to uh, swear in our witnesses. So. Uh, if uh, each of you will stand and wait, raise your right hand, including uh, Dr. Curry, who is on, uh, on video. Do you swear the testimony you will give before this committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help you God. I do. You may be seated. Our first uh, witness is uh, Christopher Curry. Mr. Curry uh, serves as the Director of Homeland Security and Justice at the U.S. Government Accountability Office. He leads the agency's work on national preparedness, emergency management, and critical infrastructure protection uh, issues. Ms. Curry brings almost uh, 20 years of federal experience, and his expertise includes the evaluation of federal efforts and programs 
to prevent, plan for, and respond to both natural and man-made uh, disasters. Uh, welcome back, Mr. Curry. Uh, you may proceed with your opening remarks. Thank you very much, Chairman Peters and Ranking Member Portman. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here today to discuss uh, GAO's work on biosecurity. I'm sorry I can't be there with you in person. But today I'd like to focus on two key areas. First is how we can strengthen efforts across the federal government. And second are the steps that the Department of Homeland Security can take to strengthen biosecurity. Uh, for a decade, well before the pandemic, we've been concerned about our preparedness for a large scale biological event and have called for a better strategy. Um, you know, this committee has held many hearings over the years on this issue as well. We're, we were concerned that the biodefense was too fragmented and uncoordinated across all levels of government and the private sector too. And unfortunately, COVID-19 showed that these gaps were real. Uh, the 2018 biodefense strategy laid the foundation for the type of coordination needed to better prepare uh, for events like COVID-19. But the bad news is that the strategy was new when the pandemic hit. The good news is, is the pandemic put the spotlight on this, creating an opportunity to effectively implement the strategy for future events in the years to come. For the last two years under COVID, we've been focused on how to successfully implement the biodefense strategy and implement the lessons we've learned from COVID-19. Two years ago, we made recommendations to better implement this strategy, uh, which are even more important today, I think. For example, one recommendation centered around being able to make resource and priority decisions across agencies that just can't tell each other what to do, like the Department of Defense, Agriculture, Health and Human Services, and DHS. This still has not been completed. We still don't have a system where we can do that fully. We've also recently looked back on interagency biological plans, exercises, and after action reports done in the years before COVID-19. Many of the problems and the challenges that occurred in COVID response were identified in prior exercises and after action reviews. For example, prior exercises and reports from past events like Ebola, uh, Zika and others found that coordinating at the federal level and between the feds and the states was going to be a huge challenge. But we saw this to be the case in the COVID response, particularly as it relates to supply chains. The problem is, is that these gaps weren't closed because no one agency was accountable for monitoring or closing them. And while we'll never close all the gaps, uh, we certainly could have closed some of them beforehand. And I, you know, I think this simply just can't happen again. We have to ensure that the lessons learned from COVID and the exercises we do in the future are not forgotten once this passes. Now, I'd, I'd like to turn to DHS too. In the biodefense area, since 2012, we've reported on challenges in implementing BioWatch, which is, as you said, is the system to detect an aerosolized or airborne bio attack. Just last year, we reported on challenges in the effort to upgrade the system. Uh, and, and move to BD21, as you talked about, Mr. Chairman, in your opening statement, we found that BD21 faces a number of technology challenges, mainly the inherent limitations in the technology and the uncertainties, this is important, of combining these technologies for use in the domestic environment in the U.S., like in train stations and sporting events. It's very different than trying to do it in a lab or, you know, in the defense or, or the, the war environment. Um, it's a huge challenge. For example, the false alarm issue is still a big problem that has to be overcome if DHS is to more quickly detect bio threats in these environments. We've also found that DHS's CWMD office has struggled to develop an effective surveillance system uh, for bio threats. For example, the National Biosurveillance Integration Center at DHS has struggled to fulfill its mandate and provide value to its partners at the federal, state, and local level. And lastly, I know the committee is also interested in the effectiveness of the uh, CWMB office in general, since the, pro, uh, the office was set up and reorganized. Overall, I think the office is on a, a better track and is beginning to mature now several years after being created. Morale has improved slightly. Uh, it's still not great, but it's improved particularly in some of the areas of employee engagement, which is important. Also, I think the leadership there is committed to implementing our past recommendations and more importantly, sticking to best practices that have helped other organizations reorganize and transform effectively in the government. For example, I know the office is working to better communicate with internal and external partners. This is something that 
faltered during the reorganization is taking some time to restart effectively. We're currently finishing a, a review of the office and we plan to issue a report on that in the coming months. This completes my statement and I look forward to the discussion and questions. Thank you, uh, Mr. Curry. Our next witness is uh, Dr. Asha M. George. As a public health security professional, Dr. George serves as the executive director of the Bipartisan Commission on Biodefense, a commission whose mission is to provide a comprehensive assessment of the state of U.S. biodefense efforts and issue recommendations. She has also served in the uh, U.S. House of Representatives as a subcommittee staff director at the House Committee on Homeland Security and brings a wealth of experience through her contracting work with DHS and the Department of Health and Human Services. Prior to her role, she served on active duty in the United States Army as a military intelligence officer and as a decorated Desert Storm veteran. Welcome back, Dr. George. Uh, thank you for your service, uh, and you are uh, recognized for your opening comments. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chairman Peters, Ranking Member Portman, uh, Senator uh, Romney, Senator Padilla, and the rest of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today about the state of American biosecurity preparedness. Uh, as the chairman said, I am Asha George. I am the executive director of the Bipartisan Commission on Biodefense, which is co-chaired by former senator and chairman of this committee, Joe Lieberman, and former Secretary of Homeland Security, Governor Tom Ridge. They and the rest of our commissioners send you their greetings and thank you for continuing to secure the homeland and examine national biodefense. Senator Lieberman and Governor Ridge testified before this very committee in 2015 when our commission released its first report, a national blueprint on biodefense. They warned that the biological threat to the nation was rising and they informed this committee uh, that the nation was insufficiently prepared to handle a large scale biological event. Sadly, COVID-19 emerged and proved our point. A little over six years after that hearing, I come before you today to warn you that again, while COVID-19 dominates our national and global attention, the biological threat continues to increase. And while some strides have been made, we are still not sufficiently prepared. Last year, the State Department released a report in which it stated clearly and unequivocally that Russia and North Korea now possess active biological weapons programs with China and Iran not far behind. We must assume that our enemies, both nation states and terrorists, are paying attention to the vulnerabilities revealed during COVID-19 and that we must prepare for an attack on the U.S. homeland with biological weapons. We cannot afford to optimize for COVID-19 or other naturally occurring diseases with pandemic potential to the exclusion of all else. U.S. biopreparedness, as the chairman said, is fractionated, multifaceted, and distributed across all levels of government and much of the private sector. All 15 cabinet departments, eight independent agencies, and one independent institution are responsible for biodefense, including preparedness. Since the release of our blueprint, some improvements have certainly been made. For example, Congress required and the Trump administration released a national biodefense strategy to align all existing policies and programs across the federal government. And the Biden administration is said to be refining that strategy now. But in many other ways, we either made no headway or took backward steps. For example, we participated in exercises that demonstrated over and over again that a large-scale biological event would overcome the government and nation quickly. But we did not take decisive action to ensure that those lessons observed became lessons learned. Many of the homeland security assets we have in place today are inadequate to meet the biological threat. We do not believe the Department of Homeland Security's BioWatch program, for example, will be able to detect biological attacks on our country effectively. Last year, we issued a report, Saving Sisyphus, Advanced Biodetection for the 21st Century, to describe our concerns and make recommendations as to what can be done to achieve the vision for the biological BioWatch program begun in 2003. It has been painful watching the DHS uh, try over and over again, like Sisyphus pushing the boulder up the mount, to create an effective biodetection system that serves the needs of the nation. 
Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member, and members of the committee, I suggest to you that 19 years is long enough for things to have gone on the way they have with this program. We recommend that you either shut it down or replace it with a program that works the way you want it to. Our states, localities, and taxpayers deserve no less, and the good people working in the Department of Homeland Security deserve some relief. I want to applaud the biodefense efforts of FEMA, the Coast Guard, CBP, ICE, the Secret Service, TSA, and CISA. All contribute directly to defending the nation against biological threats. They deserve your awareness, oversight, and support. But as you examine the Department's Countering Weapons of Mass Destruction Office, I urge the committee to clarify its role. The legislation authorizing this office lacks direction and specificity, and it needs direction and guidance from you. Thank you again for the opportunity to come before you today with the concerns and recommendations of the Bipartisan Commission on Biodefense. I would like to thank Hudson Institute for serving as our fiscal sponsor, our donors for supporting the work of the commission, and congressional staff, of course, for their tireless efforts to address this important topic. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. George. Our uh, final witness is uh, Dr. Gerald Parker, Associate Dean for the Global One Health at uh, Texas A&M University and Chair of the National Science Advisory Board for Biosecurity. He is responsible for leading and coordinating the Global One Health Program, which works to improve global health by collaborating with national and international experts to pursue groundbreaking health solutions. He brings over 36 years of public service in biodefense, high consequence uh, emerging infectious diseases, and global health security. He is also a former commander and deputy commander of the U.S. Army Medical Research Institute of Infectious Diseases. Dr. Parker, uh, welcome to our committee, uh, and thank you for your service. You may proceed with your opening remarks. Well, thank you. Uh, it's an honor to be here. So Chairman Peters, Ranking Member Portman, and distinguished members of the committee, I am honored to appear before you today for this hearing addressing gaps in America's biosecurity preparedness. As the chairman said, I am Gerald Parker, Associate Dean for Global One Health and Director of the Pandemic and Biosecurity Policy Program at Texas A&M University. But today, the views and opinions I have uh, are my own. And, but they are informed by serving in career executive leadership positions in DOD, including USAMRIT and in the Pentagon, as well as at ASPR, DHS, and a recent tour back to ASPR at HHS at the end of last year. COVID has exposed the stark reality that a novel respiratory virus can emerge anywhere and spread around the world in weeks with devastating consequences. We knew a pandemic was coming, but it was difficult to predict when, what, where, and how a novel virus would emerge. And despite many acknowledged failures that continue to accrue with a response, I submit that actually we were more prepared before SARS-2 emerged than critics will acknowledge. After the terrorist attacks of 9-11 and letters containing de deadly anthrax spores were mailed in the fall of 2001, Congress authorized new programs and appropriated new funds over the years as the threats evolved and we accrued some lessons observed. Some of them turned into lessons learned, some of them not. That founded a learning biosecurity and pandemic and all hazards preparedness enterprise. So we were better prepared than we would have been before SARS-2 emerged, had it not been of the long support of Congress and importantly, the, the work and of many dedicated career professionals in government at all levels, in industry, academia, and other NGOs. We need to acknowledge the hard work of many. For exa example, the accelerated development of safe and affected COVID vaccines through Operation Warp Speed would not have been possible without prior congressional support since 2001. This enabled the executive branch to establish new programs in health security vaccines and therapeutics research, development, manufacturing, and regulatory science. This came with hard and painful lessons learned, but steady, steady progress was made over its 20-year journey. But OWS was successful in crisis because HHS and DOD leaders took charge, each assuming ownership and accountability, while they established a strict chain of command, empowered their subordinates, and put in place procedures to protect the integrity of Operation Warp Speed. FDA also provided a fine regulatory pathway, industry stepped up to the challenge, and Congress provided the appropriations. Together, a sort of sympathy, sympathy 
was established with countless moving parts, diverse expertise, and a clear conductor bringing the pieces together. But looking back on the response to date, it is clear we remain dangerously vulnerable to the next inevitable biosecurity crisis, whether natural, deliberate, or accidental. The executive branch, Congress, and scientists have debated the appropriate level of investment and attention necessary to defend against biological threats for over two decades. Some must have thought it was a hypothetical debate. COVID revealed it was not hypothetical. We must be prepared for the next inevitable biosecurity crisis. The COVID lessons learned do not teach us the value of preparedness. I do not know what will. Waiting for the next crisis to take action is too late. A national pandemic preparedness enterprise, which includes states and private sector partners, is essential for success. But that will require an effective centralized leadership structure, vision, and goals that transcends administrations. We must overcome and learn how to manage a fragmented interagency system. Without an effective leadership structure that bridges the seams in the federal bureaucracy, even the best of leaders at all levels and organizations will not be able to drive effective coordination, collaboration, communication, and innovation across the preparedness continuum during peacetime, nor during a crisis. Unfortunately, the inability to harness the fragmented interagency is a long-recognized biodefense, health security, and public health preparedness gap. Thank you for the opportunity to appear before you this hearing. I look forward to answer any questions you have, including some of the questions that aren't in my opening remarks regarding the DHS organizational challenges. Thank you. Well, thank you, uh, Dr. Parker. Well, the GAO and uh, the Bipartisan Commission uh, on Biodefense have uh, both made numerous uh, recommendations over the years that could improve our biosecurity posture here in the United States. So I I'd like to ask my first question to uh, Mr. Curry and then to, uh, to Dr. George. Uh, if each of you could give me uh, and the committee uh, your number one recommendation that remains open for the DHS from your organizations that will better prepare our nation to uh, detect and respond to biological threats. If you'd give us the, that number one recommendation and why it is your number one recommendation and why we should deal with it uh, urgently. Mr. Curry, we'll start with you and then uh, Dr. George. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, right now, two years after the pandemic started, I think the number one recommendation is about following up on the lessons learned and the after actions from COVID. Uh, I mentioned this in the opening statement before COVID. The problem is, is we had a lot of these gaps identified and these actions identified, but we didn't really have a, a mechanism of accountability to figure out who was supposed to close them and any follow up to see whether they were closed. And if we don't do that after COVID, um, then it's just the lessons learned are, are going to be an, an absolute waste. So I think for me right now, that is the number one thing we need to focus on. And, and whatever actions those might be, not just at the agency level, there could be new legislation, new roles and responsibilities identified and clarified as well, and that would require the help of Congress. Thank you, Mr. Curry. Dr. George? Um, Mr. Chairman, because you asked about the recommendations that we've already made as opposed to other recommendations that we might make, then I will tell you that our number one recommendation is to uh, shut down the BioWatch uh, and BD21 programs and replace those programs with useful technology that actually works. Um, I, I want you to know that our commission went and looked at other technologies. They, these technologies exist, they're in use in, uh, by other departments and agencies. And in fact, the CWMD office has engaged with some of those other departments and agencies uh, to develop some of this technology, uh, but has not asked them to uh, perhaps modify some of that technology for use uh, in terms of biodetection. But there's no reason to keep this just limping along the way it is. We should shut down that program and replace it with viable technology. Well, author authorization for the uh, CWMD office uh, was going to expire in 2023 unless Congress uh, takes uh, some sort of action. Before reauthorizing this office, uh, this committee is going to have to consider whether its current structure allows uh, DHS to effectively prepare for and combat potential biosecurity threats. This includes examining whether aspects of the office should be moved to other parts of DHS, 
such as the uh, chief medical officer, uh, to ensure that it can effectively carry out uh, its mission. So, Dr. George, a question for you again is, uh, if the uh, CWMD office is given more time, it's given tools and resources to develop a comprehensive strategy to combat biosecurity threats, do you believe uh, that that would address the challenges uh, that this office uh, challenges? Or, in the alternative, uh, would, you be, would it be more effective for this committee to revisit the decision to consolidate the Office of Health Affairs and the Domestic Nuclear Detection Office? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I believe the committee should revisit this decision. <clears throat> the consolidation of the department's uh, nuclear detection capabilities, biodetection capabilities, chemical detection capabilities, and a slew of other WMD-oriented related activities in this one office, has it just simply hasn't worked out particularly well. Um, there were a lot of decisions that were made that were actually not addressed by uh, statute or um, legislation. The legislation just asks that where uh, you read nuclear in the statute having to do with the domestic nuclear detection office, that that should also mean reading chemical and biological. Um, that's, that's too inadequate, and uh, you should know that none of the committees on the House side and none of the committees on the Senate side actually took up that legislation and talked about it. There's no bill report to, to go with it. Therefore, there's no guidance uh, for the Department of Under uh, Homeland Security to really understand where Congress was trying to go with it. Uh, I would absolutely recommend uh, taking a look at the various elements of this office, and I would send all of those elements right back to the rest of the department, uh, down to the operational components and over to other uh, parts of the headquarters elements. Um, the port monitors, for example, should go to the people who are securing the ports, CBP and Coast Guard. If you want to keep the biowatch detectors uh, after replacing them with better technology, then you should send those to the Secret Service that handles national special security events and to uh, perhaps to CISA uh, because they're in charge of critical infrastructure and that's where we're putting these detectors. Um, the material threat determinations uh, that are conducted by the department are for the most part conducted by the Science and Technology Directorate. They don't need CWMD managing s and and a little bit of INA to get those done. I could go on, but you, you, you see where I'm going. I think that if you did that and you uh, returned the intelligence element, the WMD intelligence people were taken out of the Office of Intelligence and Analysis and sent over to this WMD office. I think if you return these things to where they started from and send them to where it makes sense to have, have those assets, I think you'll have a stronger department and a stronger biodefense program at the department than what we have right now. Well, thank you. Thank you for a very comprehensive answer. I, I appreciate that. Dr. Parker, uh, in, in your opinion, where should the uh, chief medical officer reside within the Department of Homeland Security? Well, thank you. And, and actually, in my written testimony, I do have a description about the early days of the establishment of the chief medical officer, and I think it gives you some maybe background of why, why initially it was established um, close to the secretary. And, um, and it was established in that time when we were very much more urgently concerned about the bioterrorism threat, um, and we should be more concerned about that today, as has already been discussed. Uh, but Hurricane Katrina happened, and there was a, certainly a realization that almost every disaster, natural or, or, or intentional, that the department's going to face is going to have a huge medical public health implication. And the secretary needed to have somebody close to the secretary's position to advise on the medical public health implications of, of, um, uh, of, a, of an intentional or natural disaster. And so I, I, I firmly believe that what transpired back in the day when I was directly at DHS and HHS is, is where the chief medical officer ought to, ought to be today. You know, I think in a, in a policy advisory role, I think uh, there's no reason to encumber, say, the chief medical office with an acquisition program. 
Uh, so it's really, you think about some of the models in the Department of Defense uh, with, say, you know, a, a, a Assistant Secretary for Health Affairs. Now, they have to run the healthcare system, but it's also an advisor to the Secretary on all the implications across the services when it comes to health and, and, and uh, just health and medicine and public health. So I think there's a similar model that looking at the way DOD does it in the way I think it would be very helpful for DHS and I think would be a, a big assistance to the Secretary. Well, thank you. Thank you, Mayor Portman. You're recognized uh, for your questions. Well, first, I appreciate all the expertise I said at the outset. You know, you all have been, uh, all three of you have been sounding the alarm, and today you're able to give us more uh, specifics as to how you would deal with the shortfalls that, that you see. I was just, I was curious in listening to your responses about uh, how to not just make the structure more accountable, and, and simpler, in effect, I think that's what um, Dr. George, you are getting at, uh, but also improve the technology. And uh, one initial question I would have, maybe Dr. George, you could take this. You said that some of our adversaries have active bioweapon programs. Uh, what do our adversaries, and for that matter, our allies do with regard to protecting their citizens from, from bioattacks? And what can we learn from them? Uh, has the commission been able to analyze comparatively what other countries do? Um, Mr. Ranking Member, um, I, I think when you're talking about the four countries that I mentioned, uh, it's very difficult for the intelligence community or anybody else to figure out what they're doing um, to protect themselves or not. But what I can tell you is that Russia and China are investing billions into their bioeconomy, and part of doing that is investment in uh, protective technologies, vaccines, personal protective equipment, and anything else that will that will uh, bring the economic aspect of biology in the 21st century up to the next level. They are investing at a rate much greater than what we are investing here in the United States. It's going to start putting us at an economic disadvantage, but it's also going to put us at a protective disadvantage. Um, I, I believe that... And does, and does that relate, excuse me, but does that, does that relate to BioWatch and to the monitors as well? I, I don't know, no. Senator. I would have how about, to... How about our, our European allies or Japan or, or South Korea, other countries where we would have access to um, exactly what they're doing? And they'd, I would assume be happy to share that information. But what, have you learned anything from them as to how we could do a better job on detection? Uh, yes, Senator. I would say, uh, especially in Europe, uh, our European allies and uh, other countries with whom we are friends are working on biodetection, and I think their their approaches are, uh, are 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 different from ours. I think that they have uh, viewed this as a uh, technological challenge that needs to be iterated. Um, we started with something in 2003 that the national labs uh, produced, and 18 years, 19 years later, we're still kind of hanging around using that same technology. The Europeans have not done that. They, uh, they have gone through their cycles over and over and improved. Now, nobody, including our Department of Defense uh, and NASA, says that they've got the absolute solution that's going to work 100% of the time. But they're working on technology that's getting us closer and closer to that. And I believe we could get that information from our allies, our European allies, and possibly Japan, I don't know, mm -hmm. um, if we asked. Yeah, well, you're indicating they're, they're ahead of us in terms of the technology, uh, at least as to, as to BioWatch and, and that responsibility. Um, let, me, let me ask a, just a basic question that I think a lot of people who are watching today might be interested in. What, why didn't we detect... COVID-19, uh, why did it take us um, so long? I think it was not until January um, that we actually uh, felt like we had discovered this uh, COVID virus when, in fact, it had been around for, for a few months. Um, maybe, uh, Director uh, Curry, you could, you could start on that. Thank you, sir. Well, I mean, there's a lot of opinions as to why we may not have detected it as quickly as we want. But I mean, the point you bring up is about surveillance, which is surveillance is basically scanning the world for potential biological threats so we can get them as quick as possible and address them. And th this has been a huge challenge across 
the agencies and the biodefense enterprise. And this is something we've pointed out that multiple agencies have all tried to pursue their own surveillance systems. DHS has one, HHS has been trying to do one, DOD has one, USDA has one for zoonotic diseases. They've all been pursued separately. Some of them have not been successful and they certainly haven't been integrated together. So I think part of the problem is, is the fragmentation and the lack of integration. But one quick point I'll make is during COVID, we've created some, some new innovative surveillance systems to monitor COVID and really get down into the state and local level in the private sector, in the, in the hospitals and the pharmacies and things like that. And I think we need, to, we need to look at what we created there and not just get rid of it when COVID's over. We need to use that to develop new surveillance systems. Yeah, I know there's been some interesting research done um, for airports, as an example. Hasn't been implemented as far as I know, but uh, there has been some, some research that could be quite helpful. Dr. Parker, any thoughts on that? Sure, yes, Again, thank you. And, yeah, let me just give you, the, give you the, the precise dates here. Okay. The first COVID-19 case that the CDC confirmed was on January 21st, 2020. And uh, recent studies by public health officials suggest that it was undetected in the country um, a couple of months previous to that. Well, I think it really comes down uh, to the need to re-envision biosurveillance and take advantage of the lessons and the things that we did build as it was just recommended uh, with, with our, our COVID-19 um, and, and the data analytics. I mean, it's really phenomenal now today for COVID. We can, we can unpack and go down to the county level, the zip code level and understand what's happening as far as cases, hospitalizations, and deaths. We didn't have that capability before COVID. Uh, and we certainly stumbled out of the gate with our laboratory diagnostics uh, that's been talked about um, ad nauseum. And we need, to, we need to address some of those things in the, in the future. And we need to address it that we're not just also focused on the public health. We have to focus on animal health. We have to focus on plant health. We have to take a One Health solution as we think about these our, our, our strategy. And we had a national biodefense biosurveillance strategy, oh, I forgot, I mean, maybe it was 2012, 2013, it was some years ago, mm -hmm. um, but I don't believe we ever had a very good implementation plan of that strategy. So COVID-19 is telling us we need to re-envision what biosurveillance means and how we can do it and take advantage of our, of our lessons observed and turn them into lessons learned, but it's got to be a one health approach to do this. I mean, I can't really time, speak, just you know, we, quick. It, it is inexcusable, the dates you mentioned, that now ret retrospectively, we believe it may have been in the United States before January. And so we got to fix those things in the future so that we, our laboratories can pick it up and we're looking for, yeah. the, for the disease X's in the future. It could, could have made a, made a huge difference uh, had, had we uh, had the surveillance capability. Just quickly, I'll, and I'll, I'll be hopefully get a second round here, but yes or no, do you think we have adequate surveillance capability for uh, bio attacks and just a simple yes or no, Dr. George. No. No. Director? No. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Senator Portman. Senator Padilla, you are recognized for your questions. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, there's a number of issues I'd like to raise in my allotted time, but I want to begin by just commenting. Appreciate Dr. Parker, you mentioning that uh, Yes, dates, ability, how quickly uh, we pounced <laughs> on COVID, uh, the existence of a strategy, the existence of a plan, whether or not that plan was implemented uh, on a timely basis or completely uh, is a worthwhile discussion because uh, our public health experts and disease control uh, personnel do not operate in a vacuum. And I'll leave it at that. Um, First question I want to raise, uh, you know, as uh, the senator who represents uh, Lawrence Livermore National Lab in California, it's part of our national lab infrastructure, uh, but Livermore in particular, or, and the labs in general, are critical to advancing our ability to counter weapons of mass destruction. The lab's mission includes work at the nexus of biology, engineering, and the physical sciences to address national challenges in biosecurity, chemical security, bioenergy, and human health. The partnership specifically between the Countering Weapons of Mass Destruction Office and the National Labs is an important piece of our government's response to developing exceptional science and technology that can detect and mitigate weapons of mass destruction. So 
I'd like to ask each of you uh, just some initial thoughts on the importance of partnerships between DHS and other government entities, including national labs, and how you view that partnership developing as this committee considers the future of these efforts. We'll start with Dr. George, Dr. Parker, and then Mr. Curry. Thank you, Senator. Um, of course, those kinds of partnerships are absolutely critical, and and uh, but they need to be focused as well. You're talking about science and technology. The national labs, NASA, DARPA, all of these science-oriented, science, science uh, you know, mission-oriented entities um, uh, can be utilized in, and worked with in any number of ways. But, you know, in this case, we're talking about basic science. We're talking about the scientific endeavor. And I think you have to ask, when we're talking about which organizational element ought to be working with them from the department, we have to ask, is it appropriate for the CWMD office or the science and technology office to be conducting those partnerships? I submit to you that if this is a basic science issue that we're talking about, and with, for example, with BioWatch, then 19 years of the Office of Health Affairs and then CWMD trying to engage and then sometimes not engaging with the national labs and so forth is, is enough and problematic. Um, they probably should never have been doing it. I think it should have been the Science and Technology Directorate that had been doing it. Um, I think the National Labs stand by. Livermore produced the first uh, biowatch detector anyhow. Um, I, I am confident that the National Labs and the other uh, uh, science and technology uh, organizations throughout the country could, could address this if given the opportunity. Dr. Parker, briefly. Sure, and yeah, thanks. And first, uh, I'm a big fan of Lawrence Livermore National Lab and uh, get the opportunity to, to in fact, I think uh, maybe next month. But anyway, I think, I think uh, um, Lawrence Livermore National Lab and the other national labs actually have, have an incredibly important part to play here. And, and one reason why they're so effective is that they can, they can get into the very deep basic science, but they approach it from an operational perspective. And that's one thing that's really unique about our national labs and Livermore in, in particular. So I, I think uh, anything we can do to encourage um, actually the re-engagement of S&T uh, into the transformative science that is needed for detection, diagnostics, and surveillance and data informatics, which is another strength of the lab, um, uh, needs to be in, encouraged and take advantage of that unique um, scientific expertise that our national labs and Livermore specifically that has an op operational orientation. Okay. Uh, Mr. Kerr, I'm interested in your thoughts, but I want to uh, actually get ask you a specific question on a different topic here in a second. A follow-up question for Dr. Parker. Uh, as you know, robust and timely data uh, has become an essential tool in effective government responses. Unfortunately, when it came to COVID, uh, COVID proved how the lack of data or timely data can cause harm and stalled responses to biological incidents. Multiple agencies reported issues tracking health data and coordinating with the federal government to ensure that we had a full and complete picture of the pandemic, which we had it much earlier on. In some cases, states uh, did not report or collect whether it was racial data or other data that would have been illuminating uh, until we were well into the pandemic. Can you describe our current capabilities uh, or lack thereof to track health data in a way that would allow us to more quickly identify and neutralize biological threats? I know we kind of ventured into this under uh, Senator Portman's questions, but uh, anything sure. more precise and what recommendations? Yeah, you have? sure. I, I mean, I can I can share some personal, you know, just observations when I had a front line when I was detailed back to Asper at the end of last year during during the COVID response, and actually, it you know, it took several months actually before the data analytics and the ability to you know have a, um, a comprehensive view down to the zip code level of hospitalizations, death cases, and and so forth. You know, it was really it was not until hospitals started. Um, being able to tap the data from the hospital system that we began to get that, and that was six months into COVID. And so we've got to be able to kind of take those lessons learned as we go forward and not let those systems be atrophy, uh, for lack of a better term at the moment. We've, we've got to do this. And and it's hard, I mean, because the data is, is owned by 
many different organizations. So this is not an easy challenge, but we've got we've got to figure out how do we keep those pipes open yep. when there is a crisis that can be turned on instantaneously so that we can get the situation awareness that's needed. Yeah, I uh, never would have imagined a day when uh, uh, the general public is tracking cases, deaths, yeah. you know, hospitalization rates, and the distinction between hospitalization, ICUs, ventilators, positivity yeah. rates, et cetera, and we haven't even scratched the surface on this variant versus that variant. Right. By zip code. Well, uh, Mr. Yeah, Mr. But, Chair, I know uh, my time is just about up, but I do have one more topic I, I'm eager to uh, get Mr. Curry's thoughts on, and it's this. Uh, as we know, COVID-19 has exposed significant inequities in our healthcare system, as well as pandemic response. In particular, the pandemic has highlighted the racial and income disparities in our approach to public health. Hospitalization uh, and emergency department visits were significantly and persistently higher among minority populations, while vaccination rates lagged in those very same communities. And this was the case across the country. You know, there's a clear evidence of the stark contrast between those with resources faring better during emergencies versus communities, families, individuals without uh, sufficient resources. So as we think about ensuring our biodefense response uh, and how we can build on the lessons learned during the COVID pandemic, I think it's critical that we're intentional about addressing equity and the unique needs of minority and other vulnerable populations. For example, some residents do not have access to reliable high-speed internet uh, or communities whose primary or preferred language is not English. Linguistic barriers have long been recognized as a contributing factor to health disparities. So, Mr. Curry, uh, how can the government better plan to address these racial and other disparities in bio-threat responses, and what recommendations would you have for the committee on how uh, we not repeat the COVID experience and do better in the future? Thank you, Senator. I mean, I think the first step is uh, recognizing the issue, recognizing the problem. And I think you know, the administration has put out uh, executive orders last year on uh, focusing federal programs better on racial equity and other equity issues. That's that's one step. But another thing, I think I'll, I'll just go back to the data. I think part of the problem we saw at the beginning of COVID, and we see this in other disasters, too, for disaster assistance programs, is that there's really not a lot of data and wasn't a lot of data on how these programs impact certain populations, uh, certain parts of the country, rural versus urban. And that created a lot of questions about how effective they were and makes it really difficult for the federal government to target resources as well. So I think that's that's a first step we have to take to to get better at this. All right. Thank you very much. Look forward to uh, following up with you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Senator Pradillo. I need to step away uh, to attend uh, briefly an Armed Services Committee. Uh, Ranking Member Portman will uh, take the gavel and has some additional questions. Great. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have a number of uh, questions, uh, looking for some quick answers just to help uh, us to be able to uh, figure out a, a better way to uh, move forward in terms of the, the fragmentation that's currently out there that we've heard about today in terms of uh, responding to uh, bio threats and also uh, trying to figure out better, you know, what's working, what's not working in the, in the current system. Um, but let me start with regard to a question about academia and uh, maybe, Dr. Parker, you're the best person to answer this because that's where you reside now. Uh, it, does DHS and do other uh, entities, including CDC, uh, that have biosecurity programs effectively leverage U.S. research universities? Is there a, is there a good relationship with academia? Well, I think early, early in the, uh, and I'll make this short, early in the um, life of DHS, there was a creation of the University Centers of Excellence. And that's been, I think, a very good and effective program to engage academia. Now, the threats have evolved and the priorities have evolved over time. And, and, and I, what I've observed is biosecurity has been kind of downregulated in importance for those University Centers of Excellence. At early, early days, there was um, several, um, there was two, three centers that were focused on agricultural biosecurity and food security. Those have been emeritus status today. So it sounds like that could, that could be revamped uh, as it was perhaps uh, after the anthrax attacks and, and other incidents. Correct. Um, 
because I think that's one thing that's that's missing in the current system is having a more formalized way to access uh, some of our our great advantages as a country, which is our research universities. We talked earlier about how some countries are ahead of us now in terms of surveillance, but we certainly have a a a, a huge advantage in terms of using uh, U.S. research capability. So that's one thing we want to work on with you. Um, Dr. Kerr, you may be the best person to answer this. There's another group we haven't talked about today, uh, at least in any detail, and that's the National Biosurveillance Integration Center, uh, NBIC. Um, is it needed? Is it helpful? Uh, does it add something beyond what CDC already does? Uh, NBIC is part of CWMD, so it's part of DHS, and then you also have CDC with, it seems to me, a similar responsibility. Uh, talk to us about NBIC. Yes, sir. Well, we've reported on it several times over the last decade, and uh, what we've found pretty consistently is they've struggled to meet their mandate of providing broad biosurveillance. Uh, part of that is that they don't really have the access to the data they need, both the data at other federal agencies or down at the local level, to produce the kind of real-time information you would need to make decisions. The other thing we heard from its partners, particularly at the federal level and state level, is that you know, since they use a lot of publicly available information and, and they do a pretty good job of synthesizing that information, it's not really new or that novel to uh, the people that need to make decisions in this arena. So, um, you know, it's not that what they produce has no value, but uh, another concern I have is that, I mentioned this before, there are four different surveillance efforts across the four big departments, uh, Homeland Security, Defense, USDA, and HHS, all separate, all stovepipe, don't work together, some have been successful for their individual purposes, some have not. And I think that just shows you the lack of coordination across this whole enterprise. It's, it's very difficult to make the decision of which one should go and which should stay because there's no one at a top level that can say, that they can make that decision. Yeah. Well, this is, I think this has been brought up by all three of you in one way or another, that there is too much fragmentation, not enough accountability. And uh, to have four different departments or agencies uh, effectively trying to, to uh, achieve the same mission and perhaps not sharing information from what you said between themselves, that's an opportunity for us uh, in terms of reorganization. Um, the, uh, the, the, the problem that I see, and I don't want to get into anything that's classified here, uh, but is that we, we have surveillance capability at, in certain areas, certain urban centers. Um, and this information is publicly available. Uh, I'm not going to name the number of cities, uh, even though it's publicly available, uh, because I just like to stay away from that sort of stuff. But it's, um, it's not comprehensive, and everybody knows that. Second, when you look at the biological threats we face today, um, it's not comprehensive. And that goes to the technology issue, and that's one reason I asked earlier about what other countries are doing and you know, whether we can learn and whether academia is fully engaged, because it seems to me we have an opportunity here to have better technology. Um, could you address that in, an, in the appropriate way, uh, Dr. George? Um, and uh, you know, we don't want to give our adversaries information that they shouldn't have, but we also got to figure out how to fix the system so it's more effective. Well, Senator, I. I think you're absolutely right. What we want is a comprehensive system, and that system w or a comprehensive coverage of the entire country. Um, what that would require is drawing information and data from a variety of dif different sources. So it's okay that we don't have BioWatch in every single jurisdiction throughout the country, but we have it in the number that we do have it, and that information should be coming into a place uh, and combined with the information we're getting from MBIC, the information we're getting from the CDC, and so forth. Um, that was the original vision for the National Biosurveillance Integration Center. Um, as Chris said earlier, uh, the department doesn't have the access it needs to that information. Uh, but I think the other, the other side of that coin, as far as this body is concerned, is that Congress did not mandate that all of the other departments and agencies provide that information in the first place. So, you know, it's just going along uh, the, the way it is. Um, I think that... Yes, sir. For a second. So there's obviously two great opportunities here. One would be to require that all the information is consolidated in one place. MBIC probably is the place to do it. Um, and second is, and I think uh, this was discussed earlier, Dr. Parker, in terms of the uh, 
uh, ac academic um, co contribution here is that we have capability to uh, collect and assess data that we have never had before, didn't have, frankly, after uh, anthrax and, and, and other uh, biological threats that led us to try to come up with a national system. So we have the capability to do this in ways we've never had before, and massive amounts of data being analyzed quickly and, and being able to uh, produce something that's meaningful that can then be disseminated to the appropriate agencies and departments. Is that accurate? Senator, I think we have the capability as a nation we do not have that data analysis capability at the Department of Homeland Security and certainly not in the National Biosurveillance Integration Center. So you would have to decide to make that kind of investment in that part of DHS or somewhere else in, in the government if you mm -hmm. choose. Um, but we, we can get there. It's just going to require some more, more money and upgrading that capability. Mm -hmm. Great. My time has expired. Um, I'm going to turn it to the new chair of this committee. Uh, Senator Hassan. Well, thank you very much. Thank you all. Uh, I, I want to thank you, Senator Portman and uh, Senator Peters, for holding this hearing. And I want to thank the witnesses for your testimony and for providing your expertise and perspective on this really important issue. Um, and because I've been in and out a little bit, I may be a little bit repetitive and apologies in advance if I am. But I want to start with a question to you, Dr. George. To detect biological threats, the Department of Homeland Security has mainly focused on directly detecting airborne biological agents through its BioWatch program. However, BioWatch is only able to detect biological agents from a limited known library of threats, which leaves a critical blind spot in our detection system, especially since naturally occurring disease outbreaks and accidental releases are likely to consist of previously unknown biological agents. The department is attempting to replace BioWatch with a new program, but the readiness, as I understand it, of that technology is still really years away. Dr. George, can you speak to what a successful biodetection program looks like and how current federal programs fall short? Yes, Senator. So a successful biodetection program has a number of different kinds of detectors within it and spread all throughout the United States, at least for our nation. Um, it's fine to have the BioWatch detectors if you can get the, the uh, equipment to the point where it's actually detecting what it's supposed to. Right. Um, but you're absolutely right. We are facing so many other threats than just the handful of threats that BioWatch was supposed to uh, pick up on. So you also need other pieces of equipment. So, for example, um, you could have uh, particle detectors that, that aren't looking for specific agents but are looking to see how many particles are in a particular room or an area right. Uh, and can note that, hey, suddenly we're seeing a whole bunch of something or a whole bunch of virus in this one place. What is that? Uh, and send the alert to somebody else to go take a look. Um, we also have, you know, there are handheld detectors. There are all kinds of detectors. There are detectors you can put inside, detectors you can put outside. I think we need a vast panoply of those uh, spread out all over the place and gather all that information together because... If you look at how we detect disease anyway, whether we have a detector or not, we're always drawing on a number of pieces of information. Hey, there's something going on over in China. Oh, look, somebody's in a hospital now. This seems to be unexplained. Medicare has some things to say. CVS is suddenly reporting that everybody's running in to get certain medications right. from them and so forth. That's how you would how, that's how you would put together such a system. Really collecting a, a cross-section of data each of which is signaling, right. um, you know, a particular proof point and right. doing it in a, a broad range of areas. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, this is a question to Mr. Curry and Dr. Parker. Uh, one way that we can detect biological threats is screening patients at hospitals and other healthcare facilities. And there was just a discussion as I came in with Senator Portman on this issue of what kind of data do we have, but. Um, as I understand, much of this data would be collected by non-federal entities. So federal agencies would need to closely coordinate with them. Unfortunately, as the Government Accountability Office reports, the current national biodefense strategy does not assess non-federal biodefense capabilities, nor does it establish a mechanism for better coordination with non-federal entities. So 
Mr. Curry and Dr. Parker, how can the federal government ensure that its non-federal partners have the capabilities to detect and collect information on potential biological threats? And how can Congress act to better coordinate federal and non-federal efforts? And I'll start with Mr. Curry, and then we'll go to Dr. Parker. Thank you, Senator Hassan. I couldn't think of a better example of a lesson learned from COVID-19 than better coordination with non-federal entities. I mean, we saw this with not just uh, issues related to the strategic national stockpile, but how supplies are distributed throughout the country. Uh, you know, that being different in every state, it just perfectly encapsulated the challenge there. So, I, I mean, in my view, the, the thing that we can do, Dr. Parker said earlier, made a great point that we have these lessons learned that we've seen in COVID. We've developed these monitoring systems, these tracking systems, these coordination mechanisms. These need to be formalized. We need to execute and implement these formally post COVID for the future. And I think that may require, because this issue crosses committees of jurisdiction, it crosses federal departments, that will likely require uh, legislation and other actions to do that formally. Yeah. Dr. Parker. Sure, and I'll just echo that and add on in a couple of exa examples. I know in, uh, in HHS, I observed for 10 during COVID response, the establishment of the supply chain control tower that was able to link SNS with all the private sector and get visibility of the supply chains, and that would be able to focus, uh, actually anticipate where supplies were going to be short. And then that evolved into the healthcare control chain tower that similarly could really anticipate where there were going to be shortages in a hospital system somewhere in the United States and, and shifts could be made in coordination with the federal government and the private sector so they could be working in unison. So we've just got to figure out how we can tap those lessons observed and turn them into to lessons learned. And it may not be something that, that's practiced on a day-to-day -day basis, but when there's a crisis, we have to be able to turn those data informatic, informatic pipes on so that we can have that coordination between between the appropriate federal and state and local yeah. authorities and the private sector partners. Yeah. No, I mean, we're, we're a system of federalism. We need to be able to uh, apply that when we're talking about data sharing uh, as well. Um, to Mr. Curry, the strategic national stockpile should be a critical tool for responding to biosecurity incidents by quickly providing medical supplies to aid in the response. What are the most significant challenges when it comes to managing the strategic national stockpile? Well, ma'am, since COVID and, and really well before COVID, we've had a number of concerns about the strategic national stockpile. Before COVID, we were actually concerned about the way it was funded sporadically and what that might mean in terms of its readiness to handle an event like this. As you know, in the past, it was used to handle more localized events like H1N1 or Zika or things you know, where you needed to target a specific area of the country or a specific smaller population. Uh, of course, in COVID, we needed it nationwide and, and it wasn't ready. So um, I think one of the one of the biggest challenges that we've identified is just the, the lack of understanding at the, all levels of government, including across the federal partnership, about how this how this the stockpile is is distributed and procured. Procurement was an important piece of this because you can't keep enough things on stock or in a warehouse to deploy throughout the whole country. So you have to be able to procure up and acquire those things when you need them. And we yeah. just weren't ready to do that. Yeah. Well, thank you. Um, given th these challenges, um, I'm committed to working with my colleagues on this committee and on the Health Education, Labor, and Pensions Committee to pass provisions that we have in a bipartisan bill, um, which is called the Strengthening America's Strategic National Stockpile Act. It already passed the House. Uh, we will continue to work to see if we can get it uh, through on the Senate side, uh, because I think you know this is an opportunity for us really, um, really to to make progress and and build up the kind of stockpile that that would help. I hope there is not another um, crisis like the one we are going through right now, but we need to be prepared for it to be sure. Um, with that, uh, I am well over my time, and I can recognize Senator Sinema, who should be joining us remotely. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman, and thank you to our witnesses for joining us today. You know, the testimony that we've heard today is worrisome. The threat of a biological event in the United States must be taken seriously, and we need to work together deliberately and in a bipartisan manner to ensure the safety of our communities. We must work to make sure communities in my state of Arizona and those all across the nation are protected from both accidental and intentional events. So my first question is for Mr. Curry. 
Your testimony focuses on what has happened since Congress first addressed the biosecurity risks in 2016, but since then it seems DHS has had the largest role. While DHS and USDA have expertise in biosecurity, they're smaller departments with fewer resources than the Department of Defense. So considering the resources of the DOD, should we look at ways in which the DOD could take on a larger role? And if so, what could that entail? Yes, ma'am. Thank you for the question. Um, it, it's a great point. I mean, DOD has decades and decades of experience in biosecurity uh, that they have had to do to prepare for a war and to protect war fighters. So I agree, there's a tremendous uh, number of lessons learned, uh, research and and efforts at the Department of Defense that can be learned by the domestic agencies like uh, Department of Homeland Security and USDA. Uh, I will say this though, um, while the technology I think uh, would be helpful and the coordination would be great, applying some of these technologies in the homeland is actually I think one of the biggest challenges because while basic research is part of the solution, when you apply these technologies to train stations and subway stations and, and crowded places in this country, uh, it's very, very different in terms of the way it needs to work. And, and for example, you know, you just can't have false alarms. Uh, that doesn't work if you have to evacuate a subway station. So uh, it's a very technically complicated issue here in the homeland, but I, I agree with you, the Department of Defense has a big role to play. Thank you. Uh, with various agencies focused on separate pieces of our biosecurity initiatives and considering the broad coordination required for quick response to an emergency, do you believe that our federal workforce is prepared to prevent or respond to an attack? And if not, where are the skills gaps and are there specific steps that Congress should take to ensure that we're hiring and retaining the correct staff? Again, for you, Mr. Curry. Thank you. Uh, I, I think we're much better off today than we were in early 2020 or late 2019. I, I think that, you know most uh, departments and agencies in the workforce in it are, are, are accustomed to this being part of their mission. Even some departments that uh, didn't think they were going to have a role in a public health emergency in the past. So we're much better off. But but I agree. I mean, we need to we need to continue focusing on preparing for this effort and putting people in place across the government that that are going to focus on this. Thank you. Uh, next, I'll turn to Dr. Parker. Your work shows how important it is for Congress to communicate and work together. You also note that COVID fatigue creates additional risk because it, it's virtually certain that our nation will see additional biosecurity challenges in the future. So taking into account what we've learned from the COVID-19 pandemic and the reaction of Americans to the continued threat of the virus, what steps can we take in partnership with state and local governments to close existing biosecurity gaps that require immediate attention? Well, thank you for the question. I think the first and foremost thing that we really need to do is, is um, address some of the, the federal interagency uh, seams and figuring out how to better manage the seams between the different federal departments and agencies. And that's going to require strong centralized leadership, probably in the National Security Council, or perhaps co-chaired by the National Security Council and Office of Science and Technology. To technology policy. We've got to have a clear strategic vision and goals, and we have to have buy-in then from our state and local leaders, emergency management, public health, and we have to get buy-in also from industry partners as well and university partners and NGOs. And so it starts with a good strategic plan and getting buy-in um, uh, leadership at the highest levels of our government, that this is important. It takes, it takes support from Congress. This is, this is going to be a, important, and there's going to be authorizations and appropriations, and then we have to have, have buy-in all the way through. So there's got to be a lot of dialogue. Leaders, good leaders, engage with their partners and stakeholders, and it's a, it's a two-way conversation. So all that's going to be essential to make sure that we have a national preparedness plan, not just a federal plan. Thank you. Well, thank you. My next question is for both Dr. Parker and Dr. George. You both addressed the lack of leadership and focus at DHS regarding biosecurity. Much of your analysis describes structural issues and difficulty working across many agencies, work groups, and related barriers. Do you believe the country would be safer if we created one independent agency solely focused on this biosecurity? Or should this be addressed by providing DHS leadership with more authority and accountability? Or another option? Who do you want to go first? Go ahead, <laughs> Dr. George. Uh, thank you, Senator Sinema. Um, I think that uh, creating an independent agency would be a mistake. 
Um, every department and agency, uh, well, sorry, every cabinet department, eight independent agencies and one institution uh, have responsibilities for biodefense. I think across the board, including the Department of Homeland Security, those all of those uh, responsibilities should be addressed by Congress, that there should be additional uh, legislation if needed, and that all of those entities need to be coordinated. I don't think we have to pull all of that out into one independent agency, but perhaps we need, uh, we, we need an entity that will be able to coordinate across the entire government. We recommended that the uh, Vice President of the United States be put in charge of all of biodefense with a, national, a deputy national security advisor um, supporting that effort. Um, I, I still believe that that's the way to go, that the commission believes that's the way to go because you have so many departments and agencies involved. Uh, I think if you create another uh, agency, you'd have to give them some massive, massive authorities to be able to tell uh, anybody else what to do, even to get information from them. And I, I just don't think that would work very well. And I agree with Dr. George. I think um, the the way another way to think about it is the true strength and the potential of our national preparedness enterprise is we have diversity and diversity by the various departments and agencies that have their own strengths. They have their their authorities and their appropriations for kind of the lane that they work in, and they have their 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 expertise that, that we need to bring to the fight for biosecurity, uh, preparedness, and response. So the really is the challenge is how do we marshal all that strength and expertise a, across the federal interagency? That, that really is what we need to do. And then marshal that strength in working very closely with our state and local partners, particularly emergency management and public health, and then our private sector and university partners too. Thank you. And Madam Chair, I, I know that my time has expired. I have one quick question for Dr. George. Um, you specifically mentioned the need for cleaning up current statutory directives. I'd like to submit a question for the record requesting that you give us um, and submit sub specific recommendations for changes so that we can make necessary updates. Is that something that you could provide for us, Dr. George? Yes, Senator. Thank you. And Madam Chair, I um, yield back. Thank you, uh, Senator. Oh, Mr. Chair, I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. We've been playing a little bit of musical chairs up here. It's good to, good to be back before the, uh, the committee here. Uh, well, certainly I've heard some testimony today uh, from all of our witnesses uh, that the DHS's uh, biosurveillance and detection programs have certainly struggled to define uh, their mission and to carry out uh, those missions. Uh, a major part of the DHS counter bioterrorism budget goes towards the National Biosurveillance Integration Center and BioWatch. So my question to you, uh, Dr. Parker, uh, you've been a part of biodefense uh, enterprises uh, for uh, decades, both in uh, and out of government. And you mentioned in uh, your testimony that it's time to transition BioWatch uh, once there are better technological solutions. Uh, where do you think the country is in developing uh, these uh, technologies? If you could share that with the committee, I'd appreciate it. And also, uh, what programs, capabilities, or technologies would you suggest the DHS should focus on to make sure that we are indeed prepared? Sure. Um, well, I think I do, and, and, and Dr. George has already, I think, made some very, very good comments about kind of the status of BioWatch and what we need to be doing with it. And so uh, my comment about, you know, it's time to transition BioWatch to something new. We need to really re-envision what biosurveillance is and what then DHS's role is in a national biosurveillance strategy. And at the end of the day, I do, I do believe that we are going to need environmental detectors, uh, aerosol detectors like BioWatch with improved technology. We don't need them everywhere, but we need them for for some threats. There's a reason why in the past I have testified and um, when I was still in, in government service that the top three threats, I believe, were anthrax, anthrax, and anthrax from a bioterrorism perspective. And so we better have some aer aerosol collector devices that can detect that we may have been attacked by something like that. But we need to have a comprehensive biosurveillance strategy and implementation plan that brings together the best of the CDCs and the USDA, um, De um, uh, Department of Interior for some of the wildlife surveillance as, as, as well. And then we need to be, and, and the original vision of INBIC was also to make sure that we could integrate intelligence information into this health and animal health inf information. And so that's going to be a critical part that we do, do this as well. 
for back to BioWatch, we're going to have to invest in some science and technologies, research and development to come up with the right tools, the better tools that we need for BioWatch. You know, maybe I might disagree with with Dr. George a little bit. You know, I'd be I would not be want to be the the federal official who says let's turn it off. And then three months later, we experience an aerosol release of an anthrax. And so we just got to we have to we have to have look look at those trade offs and determine what are the highest priority threats and where are the highest priority locations that we may want to deploy by the current generation of technology that we, we have with, with the BioWatch detectors, and then really uh, focus on the research and development that we can bring along transformative technologies. But we ought to look at new, I guess, new approaches. I mean, COVID-19 taught us a lot about wastewater surveillance. And so that, I think that's a ripe area for Homeland Security to look at what are some strategies we can do for these novel surveillance um, approaches. And, and wastewater surveillance is one such example. And in, the department has reached, you know, through its different components, that there are opportunities for some novel kind of really immediate surveillance uh, activities that, that could be explored if we open up our mind to a new way of thinking about how to do, the, do it. But that's got to be, we got to fix our federal interagency problems too to enable that because it's going to require interagency coordination for DHS to do that effectively. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Curry, my next question uh, is uh, for you. The, uh, the GAO, GAO report uh, reviewing the National Biodefense Strategy found that there are no clear, detailed processes, roles, and responsibilities for joint decision making including how agencies will identify opportunities to leverage resources or who will make and enforce uh, those decisions. Uh, the GAO, as you know, made uh, four priority recommendations to the DHS. All of them, unfortunately, remain open. So, Mr. Curry, if you could uh, spend a little time telling this committee the ways that you believe the federal government failed in implementing the national biodefense strategy from 2018. Thank you, sir. I think the, the good news is, is that we got a strategy and a steering committee was developed to try to have that kind of coordination. I think what we haven't seen yet is the execution on some of the tough decision making and coordination across departments. Uh, Dr. George talked about this when they recommended that the vice president be responsible for this function. I think one key here is, is that there has to be an entity or a way to look across the biodefense enterprise and make resource and programmatic decisions. And that just hasn't happened. Um, you know, OMB would have to play a big role in that, looking across to look at budgets, look at resource, but, but it's very difficult to prioritize programs, for example, to say, well, let's invest in BioWatch and not HHS's public, uh, you know, infrastructure or health surveillance infrastructure, because they can't tell each other what to do. So, that issue still hasn't been sorted out. And because the strategy was just implemented before COVID, you know, we haven't had a chance to really see some of those things play out in the budgeting process to see if they're making those kind of decisions. So, you know, I, I think we still need to get there. I'm not certain that, that the, the structure we have under the strategy is, is not able to get there eventually, but if not, then we need to do something else. Very good. Uh, one area of uh, particular concern uh, to me is that uh, within DHS, the, the CWMD's uh, workforce morale is uh, extremely low. Uh, in 2019, morale within CWMD was ranked the lowest among all sub-agencies in the federal government, uh, and it only slightly improved in 2022. An improvement's good, but it was only slightly uh, an improvement. Uh, the office certainly has faced some leadership and attrition problems uh, in recent years. So my question for you, Dr. Parker, you're someone who's worked in, in a new, numerous federal departments uh, addressing uh, CWMD threats. What would be your top recommendation to this committee as to how we might improve morale within, these, the, within this office? Yes, morale certainly, uh, whenever you learn and hear about uh, morale issues in any organization, it, it, it is always something that um, um, is concerning. I was... I was uh, encouraged to hear that there um, um, that there are some improvements, and so perhaps it's on the right track. But any time that there are um, issues in a in an organization, it's it's always important to try to understand what are the root causes, uh, and perhaps maybe all the organizational changes that have happened over the last several years. Um, change is always hard on people, and and so that 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 um, sometimes it's not surprising when you have morale issues when there there's organizational 
change, but that you know requires leadership really working very closely with people to make sure that they're part of the change, um, they're part of the change agents as, as an organization evolves from its current state to its next state. Um, but uh, finding the root cause is very important and making sure that everybody, the workforce feels like they're, they have a voice, uh, that everybody's being um, re, re, uh, treated with respect and dignity um, is always very, very important in organizational morale and organizational and mission effectiveness. Very good. Well, I would certainly like to thank uh, our witnesses uh, for joining us uh, here today. Uh, this is uh, an incredibly important discussion and certainly doesn't end today. We'll have a lot more to discuss uh, in the months and uh, years ahead. Uh, our nation continues uh, to respond to COVID-19 pandemic, and it uh, is certainly clear uh, that we knew, need to do a much better job to prepare for future biological uh, incidents. Uh, your testimony, all of your testimony, will help inform the committee in our legislative activities, such as uh, reorganizing or, and reauthor, or reorganizing and reauthorizing, perhaps, uh, the uh, CWMD office uh, and guide our oversight uh, actions in that process. Uh, I also want to thank Ranking Member Portman for uh, holding uh, this hearing uh, with me, and I look forward to working together to address these threats and to improve uh, the homeland security for our nation. Uh, I'd also like to note that, unfortunately, uh, Dr. Alex Garza, who's the former Chief Medical Officer and Assistant Secretary for Health Affairs at the Department of Homeland Security, was invited, but he was unable to uh, testify today because of uh, some personal uh, circumstances. However, uh, he was able to submit uh, his uh, written testimony, which we appreciate, and so I ask a unanimous consent that that uh, testimony be placed into the official record of the hearing. The record uh, for this hearing will remain uh, open for 15 days until 5 p.m. on March 4th, 2022 for the submission of statements and questions for the record. Uh, this hearing is now adjourned.